Welcome to Security Weekly News, episode 273 for the start of week of 12th of February, 2023. And of course, you don't need reminding, but this is Valentine's Day and there's probably still enough time to get to the gas station to pick up some flowers and a corn dog for the person that you love or just like a lot. That's probably the same. Anyway, so today on Security Weekly News, we have Clipper Malware, Chinese Hackers, a record DDoS attack, Apple Patch Zero Day Flaw, and for Valentine's Day, Love Bombing, which is what I'm going to give you all today. All this and more on today's Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. How is your business staying one step ahead of cyber criminals? Secure your email applications, network, and data with Barracuda. Protect your business and go from zero to security in no time flat. Whether your team is working in one location or many, Barracuda has solutions that are easy to buy, deploy, and use. Learn how Barracuda can protect your business against ransomware, phishing, and other cyber attacks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Barracuda, your journey secured. Welcome back. Also today on the show, we have right out of the League of Quantum Com- Supercomputers, if I could speak. Please get ready to learn something from Josh Marpet, who is standing in for the wonderful Jason Wood. I'm Aaron Leyland, and your first story of the week is Python developers beware, Clipper malware found in 450 PyPI packages. So malicious actors have published more than 451 unique Python packages on the official Python package index repository. (laughs) That's easy to say, isn't it? In an attempt to infect developer systems with Clipper malware, obviously. Okay, so supply chain, um, software supply chain security company Phylum was spotted The library said the ongoing activity is a follow-up to a campaign that they initially disclosed in November 2022. The initial vector entails using typo squatting to mimic popular packages such as Beautiful Soup, Bitcoin Live, Crypto Feed, Matplot Live, Pandas, PyTorch, and some I can't pronounce. (laughs) I'll totally mess up. But anyway, Scrappy, Selenium, Solana, and um, TensorFlow, among many others. Okay, so after an installation, a malicious Java script file is dropped to the system and executed in the background of any web browsing center. Phylum said in a report published last year, when a developer copies a cryptocurrency address, The address is replaced in the clipboard with the attacker's address. This is achieved by creating a Chromium web browser extension in the Windows app data folder and writing it to the rogue JavaScript and a manifest.json file that requests users' permissions to access and modify the clipboard. So targeted web browsers include Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Brave, and Opera with the malware modifying browser shortcuts to load the add-on automatically upon launch using the load extension command line switch. The latest set of Python packages exhibits a similar, if not the same, modus operandi and is designed to function as a clipboard-based crypto wallet replacing malware. And do you know what? They can come and steal my crypto wallets because they're all worth about nothing recently. But anyway, um, so what's changed is the obfuscation technique used to conceal the JavaScript code. And then the ultimate goal of the attacks is to hack cryptocurrency transactions initiated by the compromised developer and reroute them to attacker controlled wallets instead of the intended recipient. The attacker significantly increased their footprint in PyPI 
through automation, file them noted. Flooding the ecosystem with packages like this will continue. And these findings coincide with a report from Sonotape, which found 691 malicious packages in the NPM registry and 49 malicious packages in Heidi Pie. Heidi Pie? Is that Heidi Pew? Is that that dude off um, YouTube? Anyway, Hi PI during the month of January 2022 alone. Okay, the development once again illustrates the growing threat developers face from supply chain attacks with adversaries relying on methods like typer squatting to trick users into downloading fraudulent packages. Personally, as we can see from these type of attacks that they're not gonna go away, we all know the coders like to use libraries and borrow code from well-known repositories. So just make sure that you have a process which will catch the malicious code which might be lurking there. Okay, so the second story of today is Chinese hackers targeting South American diplomatic entities with Shadowpad. Microsoft on Monday attributed a China-based cyber espionage actor to a set of attacks targeting diplomatic entities in South America. The tech giant security intelligence team is tracking the cluster under the emerging moniker of DEV0147, describing the activity as an expansion of the group's data exfiltration operations that traditionally targeted government agencies and think tanks in Asia and Europe. Watch out think tanks. Okay, the threat actor is said to use established hacking tools obviously such as Shadowpad to infiltrate targets and maintain persistent access. So Shadowpad, also called Poison Plug, and is a successor of PlugX, Remote Access Trojan, and it's been widely put to use by Chinese adversarial collectives with links to Ministry of State Security, the MSS, and People's Liberation Army for SecureWorks. Though, so the fact that Chinese hacking groups continue to use Shadowpad, despite it being well documented over the years, suggests the technique is still yielding some success. I can tell you, state actors will have programs to attack low-hanging fruit, obviously using known tools as not to compromise zero days and um, more highly obfuscated projects. So if you think solar winds was the end of supply chain attacks, I tell you now that it's only the tip of the iceberg. If you work in a business which holds any type of intellectual property, I recommend you treat your infrastructure as if you have already been compromised and put in place techniques to find this. Personally, I would include looking for exfiltration, beaconing, and um, I'd probably recommend some sort of honeypot or honey net. At the end of the day, we should think like nation state actors. There's only so much manpower, so much of these attacks will be automated, at least at the point of compromise. And the next story is massive HTTP DDoS attack hit record high of 71 million requests a second. Seems like quite a lot, really, doesn't it? Okay, web infrastructure company Cloudflare on Monday disclosed that it thwarted a record-breaking distributed denial of service attack that peaked at over 71 million requests per second. So um, the majority of it was 50 to 70, largest exceeding 71, and they have coined a new name. I hadn't actually heard it before, and let's see if I can actually pronounce it, but calling it hypervolumetric hyper DDoS attack. Okay, there's a new one for you to learn in your foreign languages of cybersecurity. Okay, it's also the largest HTTP DDoS attack reported to date and about a third higher than the previous one that Google Cloud reckoned they mitigated in 2022. So... Cloudflare, obviously singing their own praises here, said the attack singled out why website secured by its platform and that they emanated from a botnet comprising of more than 30,000 IP addresses. 
that belonged to numerous cloud providers. Targeted websites included a popular gaming provider, doesn't say who it is, probably guess, cryptocurrency companies, hosting providers, and cloud computing platforms. HTTP attacks of this kind are designed to send a tsunami of HTTP requests towards a target website, typically an order of magnitude higher than that website can handle with the goal of rendering ex inaccessible. Think of me after a few drinks talking in an Irish accent to you and you understanding none of it. That's probably a little bit what it's like. Anyway, given a sufficiently high amount of requests, the website server will not be able to process all of the attack requests along with the legitimate user requests, Cloudflare said. Users will experience this as website, load delays, timeouts, and eventually being annoyed <laughs> and not being able to connect to their desired websites at all. Okay, the development comes as the size and sophistication and frequency of DDoS attacks are on the rise with the company reporting a 79% spike in HTTP DDoS attacks year over year in the final quarter of 2022. So what's more the number of volumetric, I think everybody should pronounce it like that. I don't even know if it's correct. Um, so the number of volumetric attacks lasting more than three hours surged by a rather large 87% um, when compared to the previous three month period. Some of the major attacked industry verticals during the time period include aviation, education, gaming, hospitality, and telecom with countries, Georgia, Belize, San Marino, and apparently some others. It's like, well, I don't know, some other top countries, whatever a top country is. It's like, um, I think we're we're just giving giving a, a I don't know, they Clyde Flair want to rate countries now. And um I'm just talking nonsense because I killed killed my um teleprompter, but it's fine. We'll just roll with it until I finally get to exactly where I was before on teleprompter. Okay. We're nearly there. It's like, I could tell you the story. So there was a woman who was at the shop the other day and her bill came to $6.66 and she didn't want 666 in her life. So she just decided to um, not test the devil and bought a corn dog. So today's all about corn dogs. Okay, nearly there. Here we go. Read all this. Okay. Could have read this bit because I wrote it. But anyway, let's go. I would suggest if your business is going to be harmed by losing online assets for a few hours, then you must invest time in a DDoS response plan. And if you Google DDoS response plan, there's plenty out there. But it probably involves, if you're in cloud computing, paying some more money. <laughs> but they love to take our money. Anyway, patch now. Apple's iOS, iPad, OS, Mac OS, and Safari under attack with new zero day flaw. Isn't there always? So Apple on Monday, which as I'm recording this was yesterday, rolled out security updates for iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, and Safari to address a zero day flaw that it said had been actively exploited in the wild. I guess the big thing here is we hear about loads of zero days and they're we don't put zero day and actively exploit it in the wild together very often because hopefully when the zero day comes out they're um well it, it's normally only state actors that are messing about with it at this point or really intelligent people so we don't see it being exploited in the wild the fact that this is exploited in the wild and it's next to zero day means um we need to get on top of it pretty fast so this is tracked as CVE 2023-23529, and the issue relates to a type confusion bug in the WebKit browser engine that could be activated when processing maliciously crafted web content, culminating in arbitrary code execution. That's the really bad bit. We don't want that. Okay, the iPhone maker said the bug was addressed with improved checks, adding that it's aware of a report that this issue may have been actively exploited. 
Oh, now they're saying may have been actively exploited, but they have seen it. That's the point. Anyway, an anonymous researcher has been credited with reporting the flaw. We probably know who you are. Okay. It's not imminently clear as to how the vulnerability is being exploited in the real world attacks, but it's the second actively abused type confusion flaw in WebKit to be patched by Apple after 2022-42856, which is the CVE number in as many months. And that was closed in December 2022. So WebClick flaws are also notable for the fact that they impact every third-party browser that's available for iOS, iPadOS, owing to Apple's restrictions that require browser vendors to use the same rendering framework. I don't know, good and bad in that, I guess. But um, I think the latest iOS is probably 16.3.1 or somewhere about there. But I don't know, I, I advise just updating your iOS when the new one comes through because it, it's not just for fun. <laughs> okay. Um, so I fell file of this the other day when I realized that my exercise bike ran on an iPad Air first generation and it won't update past iOS 13, but this will, you need an iPhone 8 and later iPad Pro all models. So if you're really expensive type tastes, you're in a good place. iPad Air third generation and later, iPad fifth generation and later, and iPad mini fifth generation and later. If anybody has any ideas what I can use other than a doorstop for my iPad Air first generation, you can bang it on Discord and I'd be happy to read that. So also we have Max running Mac OS Ventura, Big Sur and Monterey as well. So apparently in 2022, Apple remediated a total of 10 zero days Meaning that ah, God knows how many zero days there is out there that haven't been remediated if they've remediated 10. So um, nine of which were discovered as actively exploited by threat actors. Four of those flaws were discovered in WebKit. I guess the idea is here that Apple flaws with arbitrary code execution are probably picking a figure out of the air worth about a million dollars. And I reckon they're being um, utilized by sort of um, nation state actors and maybe really large is really sort of um, security companies, which I don't know, sell use of hacking to police in the iPhones and stuff like that. But um the easy thing is update, it's fixed, at least what we know about. And if you have anything worth hiding from state actors, then you really got to think hard about where you store that information. Okay, story five. Hackers create malicious Dota 2 game modes to secretly access player systems. An unknown threat actor created malicious game modes for Dota multiplayer online battle area, MOBA, video game that could have been exploited to establish backdoor access to player systems. So the mode exploited a high severity flaw in the V8 JavaScript engine cracked as CVE 2021-38003 with a CVSS score of 88. I think the point here is it was CVE 2021. That was quite a long time ago. And it was actually addressed by Google in October 2021. So since V8 was not sandboxed in Dota, the exploit on its own allowed for remote code execution against other Dota players, which is just crazy. So, um, and a vast researcher said about all that in the report last week. So following the responsible disclosure to for the responsible disclosure to Valve, the game publisher shipped fixes on January 12, 2023, by upgrading the version of V8. Okay, the, the fix is out there. If you use Dota, I suggest you go and 
bang that on as quick as possible. As we know, people in games like to hack each other and um, even, what's it called? SWAT, oh, SWATting. They even like to do SWATting. It's probably worth not falling out with someone on the internet. Be nice, people. Okay, in a hypothetical attack scenario, a player launching one of the above game modes could be targeted by threat actor to achieve remote access to the infected host and deploy additional malware for further exploitation. Okay, thinking more business here, or I would um, think about enabling a policy where all software and devices should be whitelisted. It is a bit of extra work, but it will massively pay off in your security maturity. Okay, story six. Pepsi, where's my data? Crooks, beat, breach, not beach. I'd like to go to the beach. Anybody likes to take me to the beach? Valentine's Day, I'm open to offers. America's largest beverage manufacturer, Pepsi Bottling Ventures. Um, who, I just thought it would have been Coca-Cola. But anyway, Pepsi, go Pepsi. So America's largest manufacturer and pet distributor of Pepsi Cola beverages said its network has been breached by threat actors who took off with a handful of personal and financial information. According to the breach notification letter sent to customers, the breach successfully executed. <laughs> it's just, I hope the breach notification letter didn't come through on Valentine's Day because obviously I had Valentine's Day cards island through the door this morning but um a breach notification wouldn't have been welcome in amongst all that love but <laughs> they said it was um successfully executed by deploying info stealing malware and it happened around december 23 2022 i think a big thing that we can take about this is them looking at it in december 23 2022 that isn't that long ago when we're talking about breaches. It's like when we all uh, do a CISP or a SISM course or something like that, and they're like, the average time of the mean time to detection. Oh, there you go. There's an actual phrase that we use for it, um, is seven to nine months. Um, <laughs> so this happened around 20 December 23. Hopefully, they keep logs longer than three months, but hey, who knows? I've... Um, personally seen people keep logs for 30 days and then you come to actually investigate something and it's just not even a point okay so oh right here we go so um pepsi hadn't discovered the criminal activity until january the 10th hey that's still good that's really good. Anyway, in the notice, the corporation said that an unknown party assessed its internal IT systems, installed malware, and downloaded certain information. Definitely not good. Okay, they said, we took prompt action to contain the incident and secure our systems. While we are continuing to monitor our systems for unauthorized activity, the last known date of unauthorized IT system was January 19, 2023. Um, they reported the incident to law enforcement, good for them, and are cooperating with their investigation. Okay. It says here the list of information stolen is long and scary. I don't think it's very long, but it's a little bit scary. So it, it varies by individual, um, but it included first and last names, home and email addresses, home addresses, there we go, swatting. Um, financial account data, including, and th this is really bad. This is bad, Pepsi. This is really bad. A number of passwords and PIN codes or whatever. I don't even know what this is, but other access numbers that aren't included in being a password or a PIN code. But that's really bad. That's really bad. Why that wasn't hashed or something, I don't know. So additionally, I guess the list is getting longer. The crook stole drivers, license numbers, ID cards, social security numbers, and passport information. Gets really bad again. Digital signatures and limited limited medical history. I don't know what medical history do they have. I guess it's maybe of staff or something like that. Health insurance information. This this is kind of this is a big steal. So um, Pepsi said it was not aware of any identity theft or how to do security, Pepsi, to be fair, um, or other fraud, including stolen data. The firm allegedly took prompt action to cure its systems, and it also said all company passwords have to be changed. 
what about locking everybody out so they definitely have to change it? Anyway, Pepsi, do better. Um, the breach highlights the need for companies to be proactive in protecting their sensitive information and safeguarding against cyber threats. The stolen data may be sold on the dark web, of course, the dark web, ha, 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 and used for cyber crimes such as identity theft, doxing, phishing, and just general social engineering, to be fair. Okay, Pepsi. I'm still annoyed that you never gave that dude his promised Harrier junk jet, and I'll not be drinking Pepsi until you do. Okay. Russia wants to legalize cybercrime for homeland. So naughty these days. Russia, you're just naughty. You're going to go on the bold step. The Russian government wants to decriminalize hacking as long as the attacks are carried out in the interests of the country, which is currently waging war in Ukraine. We know, get on the naughty step. Obviously, the so-called patriotic, patriotic, um, I have no clue what accent that was, hackers were already free of all prosecution anyway. The Kremlin is exploring the idea of absolving Russian hackers from criminal liability but the new order would only affect the hackers who carry out hits useful to Moscow. So Alexander, the head of state Derma Committee on Information Policy, said that the exemption would be granted to individuals, individuals located both in Russia and abroad. Yes, yes, it might be you might grant amnesty to the ones in Russia, but I don't think you can grant amnesty to ones that are abroad because hopefully we'll put them in jail. Anyway, the reason that they've said abroad is because many Russian IT professionals left the country when it announced mobilization last year. Yes, Mr. Putin, nobody wants your war, not even the Russian people, and especially according to this, not the many Russian IT professionals that left the country. Um, so it says they're firmly convinced that it is necessary to use any resources to effectively fight the enemy. That's us, guys. <laughs> That's like nearly the whole of the West. It's like everybody apart from North Korea and Iran, to be honest. And I'm not going to say too much about China because they might dox me or something. Um, anyway, bad China, also on the naughty step with Iran and North Korea. Um, so if such centers attack us today, then Russia should have the opportunity for an adequate response, Alexandra said, according to TASS. So it goes on to say the creation, use and distribution of malicious computer software are currently punishable in Russia by up to seven years in prison. And I'm telling you, only from watching documentaries, though, well, and also friends, um, you, you you don't want to be in a Russian prison, mm -mm -mm. especially way up north where it gets very cold. So currently there are no exemptions to the law. So that means that many of the current pro-Kremlin activist groups, <clears throat> um, the government, I mean, um, pro-Kremlin activist groups, are actually breaking Russian law and that they could technically face prosecution. To be honest, from reading most of the stories, I don't know, Russia just likes to prosecute and um, be authoritarian. Just about just everything to their population. Anyway, even though there's a silent understanding between such groups and the government that needs hackers in its ongoing war in Ukraine, this status quo could change if, for instance, Putin's regime is removed. Let's hope so. Anyway, however, so far, the exception would allow pro-Kremlin hacktivists to carry out attacks with a legal carte blanche. The new rule would most likely apply to the likes of Killnet, X, I, I, you know, I can't it's sad, it starts with an X, Alchnet, No Name 057, Cyber Army Russian, FRWL team, and the many, many others, <clears throat> um, government, uh, or, I mean, um, yeah, threat actors, um, non-aligned to <clears throat> government. Okay. So Kilnet is especially notorious, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Security Center, 
as at least 14 US healthcare organizations um, are actively targeted or at least attributed to be targeted by this gang. So while Killnet's threats and their trademark low level distribution denial of service, DDoS, it's back again, have been seen more as a nuisance than an actual threat. Security experts are warning attacks can become more destructive in the future and deploy malware wipers or ransomware. We definitely don't want that. Okay, so Killnet presents themselves as <clears throat> hacktivists. Government, um, I mean, um, the group gives the Russian government cover. There we go. It just gives them cover for the Russian government cover to conduct damaging attacks on Western inter institutions. So maybe there's this... Did they go on about silent understandings? Maybe there's a silent understanding that it's okay for the West to look into Russian interests? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I wouldn't like to say. I wouldn't like to say. But um, now, and now, we are going to hand over to Josh, who might have actually changed his shirt as he got the memo that it's Valentine's Day. Let's see <laughs> some further insights from Josh. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I changed my shirt, so I was wearing a, a jewel pink shirt as requested. I couldn't find my unicorn shirt, but I did find my B-Sets Delaware 2019 staff shirt. So one of the pink shirts I own. It's an amazing shade of pink, Josh, and thank you hey. very much for going with the pink thing. Not a problem. Hey, come on, it's Valentine's Day. I totally get it. It's not a problem. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so let's talk. Uh, I brought a story today about ChatGPT, and uh, I, I think there's some lovely, lovely uh, inferences here that we can make about uh, life in general. So let's talk about that. Um, uh, I apologize, Gus, are you putting up the uh, the, the, the the graphic? If not, let me know. I can fix that. But uh, ChatGPT uh, uh, and the New York uh. Times... I think we should. I think we should bash Goose. It's all Goose's problem. Get the it graphic. It's not Goose's up. problem. I Goose does amazing jokes. work. He does do amazing work, and my jokes are mostly not suitable for podcasting. So um, maybe as a second to throw that up for you now, Josh. Uh, I, I don't know if he's going to. It's not a problem. But I will tell you that what we have is uh, a New York Times article. Uh, the link should be in the show notes about uh, ChatGPT. They've, they actually did a link to ChatGPT in the New York Times where you can have ChatGPT write your Valentine's Day poem for your spouse, your partner, your, uh, uh, your therapist to Rihanna. I mean, they're very important. To yourself, to an ex, et cetera. It's got a whole list of people you can write it to and different styles as a Yelp review, as a haiku, as a Taylor Swift song. Uh, and you can do over the top, a romantic, platonic, bitter, whatever Valentine you want. And that's cute. I mean, it's a Valentine's Day thing. Using an AI to write a poem so you don't have to. And that's got a lot of interesting parallels, uh, especially when there was also a story that came out today that I don't have in the show notes about Bing, the chatbot that the new Bing has brought out, and the new Bing chatbot, you can actually apparently piss off if you tell it it's wrong. So uh, I'm really wondering, I, there's really, since it's all drop-down lists for the New York Times chat GPT one, you really can't tell it, oh, you're wrong, that's a horrible poem. But if you could, what would it do? Uh, and, and would it, you know, order a Skynet? It's like, um, there's that famous restaurant in Vegas where the all the staff are like, um, <laughs> they just- Oh, abusive. Continue. Yeah, they completely abuse you. So uh, that that's... there's like some sort of that that's come over to the UK recently, and people are raving about it because um, I think British people just like to be roasted. I, I mean, come on, from the land of austerity and 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 bangers and mash, can you blame them for wanting to be like yelled at and smacked around? <laughs> oh yeah, let let let's not go into perversions of the Tory government. Um, otherwise, <laughs> we're banned. But uh, so, so basically, you know, it's, it's a cute story because it's Valentine's Day. But the point is, is that ChatGPT is, is at this point, it's a, it's a gimmick to write you a Valentine's Day poem. I mean, it's a gimmick I used. I sent my wife one uh, and it was actually really good. But uh, on the other hand, yeah, you can piss chatbots off. You can get them upset. The, the original story was about how somebody told it that, uh, what was it? He, he wanted to know when Avatar 2 was coming out. Uh, Bing chatbot insisted that December 20, uh, sorry, February 2023 was before December 2022. 
And just like ChatGPT could tell you wrong answers, I've actually gotten it to tell me wrong answers. I asked it for national parks within a five hour drive. It gave me five parks that were 12 hours away and 20 hours away. And I'm like, wait a minute, that park isn't close by. Uh, so we checked and it was actually not close by. But if you can get a, an AI system to give you wrong answers, where is that wrong answer coming from? How is that wrong answer going to affect your actions and your plans and your, your whatever? And uh, how do we fix the wrong answers? And so while it's a cute story about romantic Valentine Day poems to whomever you want, and you don't have to do too much effort, the effort's going to be when we have to fix problems. So that's just what the story is about. I think these days, Josh, with um, we hear about Russia a lot being world world leaders, so they're like world leaders in something is um, disinformation and psyops. And if you can actually sort of teach, learn, put the data set of false information into things like the Russian Federation want you to believe this piece of information, then then we, we we really are like arguing with seagulls on the internet. There's um, no easy way to fix it. Uh, no, there's no easy way to fix it. And so I wanted to see if this will work. So if you can put me back up on screen, I can actually, I just did a screen capture of it. You can actually see the uh, all the different types you can do. I don't know if you can read this easily. Sorry, I'm doing this on the fly. It's okay, you you're doing very well. You can do a, 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 to your weed dealer. You can do a romantic Valentine to your weed dealer in the style <laughs> of Shakespeare. And it's, it's really cool, okay? But on the other hand, again, if you get it wrong and send the one to your weed dealer, to your wife or husband, that could go badly. I think Dr. Doug, I'm sure I've heard him talking about hackers before. I think we should... Um find one and um, Slack or Discord it to Dr. Doug. I think with him being away at a conference at the moment, he would he would love to receive from the Security Weekly News team a haku of love. Uh, okay, so for your friend with benefits, a romantic valentine in the style of a haiku. <laughs> there you go. Uh, There's your haiku for you, Aaron. Have fun. I send, wonder, can you read it out for, for me? Can you read a love it so me? blissful. Compassion like the sun's rays. Be my Valentine. Very good. I don't know if that's um, traditionally the way a haiku goes. I I, I can't comment. That's I'm not um, five, educated. Seven, five. I'm sure five it's syllables, good. seven syllables, five syllables. It actually is correct. Uh, I love. Oh, syllables. brilliant! Yeah, it works. Cool. Have you got anything more for this on that, Josh? No, I just, I, the big thing, I mean, uh, chat GPT and AI systems are a big topic right now. We get asked, I, Aaron, I don't know about you, but I get asked so many questions, it's not even funny. The biggest thing for me is always look where the data is coming from that it's working with and always double check your results against the data it should be using and against uh, some common sense principles that you should follow. Right. I think um, actually there's probably... Um scope to talk about this with Dr. Doug again at some point, with obviously him being one of our highly esteemed educators. He's got some really good points on this that I don't want to stay, but I remember sort of some of his points are he has a lot of educators going to him and saying, it's like we should ban this at university. But um, at the end of the day, students are going to cheat. And um I guess when Wikipedia come in and we were like, don't reference Wikipedia in your in your sort of thesis. But if you go to Wikipedia and that points you in the direction of some information, then you can search further for the veracity of that information. And I think, as you say, Josh, it's the same with ChatGPT. No, you can't just type something into it and say, this is how to bake a chocolate Guinness cake. And um, somebody naughty has put in some sort of um, something that's rather horrible into it. And you just go blindly, blind leading the blind and make your recipe to something horrible. So I think um, 
checking the veracity of information is important. Um, it can be used to point us in the right direction. I used it recently to write a load of code for me, and it was wonderful, and um, it worked really well. In fact, one of the things it was best at was commenting on the code, which everybody always complains that nobody comments their code well enough. Um, I, I think checking veracity is very important. I agree. As a matter of fact, there's an XKCD um, that is uh, done. Uh, today's XKCD, as a matter of fact, is done in the style of a weather station where there's a guy on the on the roof flipping the flipping the the the, the wind speed, the anemometer, to show that it's actually going fast. There's a hurricane going on. He's trying to show if your data is bad, your results are bad. End of story. Well said, sir. Garbage in, garbage out. Is that what we used to call it? Yeah, it basically is. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you for um, wh wh what B sites was that twenty nineteen actually? That I can't, um, that's just pre B sites Delaware. That's that's our local B sites here. B sites Delaware. We've been running it since twenty ten, uh, and we're actually mm -hmm. going to have a, a full in person B sites Delaware again in November of this year. So we're actually really really excited. I'm a big Finally, fan of B. And it's good to see it back. I used to um, get try and get the Vegas for B sides, which was just before Black Hat, which is a bit boring to be honest, unless you really have a reason to be at Black Hat. And then, of course, for the the big show, which tends to be Defcon for everyone, but um, sort of B sides just off the strip in um, Vegas culminated usually and a very nice pool party at the end of it oh absolutely absolutely just as defcon culminates with the goon pool party uh besides las vegas culminates with a very awesome nighttime pool party uh and and we had a, we have a great time uh it's been held at the tuscany for i can't even remember how yeah. many years now yeah 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 and i think um the first one i ever went to i think it was. It wasn't that long ago. It was only 2018 that I went to B sides at the Tuscany, and um, Jack Daniels, the famous Jack Daniels, turned up dressed as a swan, and he was oh god, <laughs> swanning around. Do you remember that? I heard. I, I did not go to the 2019. Uh, we had a new baby, and uh, so we we didn't go. We didn't go this past uh, summer because of another new baby. Uh, so I'm right. really rolled in a seven month old now. Uh, yeah. We're hoping to go this August, uh, or the, you know, this summer, and go to yeah. Hacker Summer Camp for the first time in way too many years, and uh, yeah. we're going to see. But yeah, I, I've heard stories of the Swan outfit. Uh, have you ever seen Jack in his Canadian tuxedo? I actually haven't, to be honest. I'm not being. It's an all around. Wrangler denim tuxedo, and it is a full tuxedo yeah. jacket. Somebody might have shown me a picture, but I think seeing it in real life at the Tiki Lounge might be um, an aspiration for me to go for this year or next. Oh, we'll see. That'd be lovely. Anyway, uh, thank uh, you for inviting me on the show. Absolute pleasure. Uh, hope to be back and do some more stories. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming, Josh. I know that um, in the future, we'll be having more guest sort of professional commentary type people. So to have you again, I'm sure myself, and Doug and Jason and the rest of the team would love that to happen. So thank you, Josh. And finally, for this week, we have feeling love bombed. It might be a romance scam. So pretend Paramours, and there's me thinking Paramore was just the name of a nice punk pop band. So pretend Paramours will go to great lengths to look as legitimate as possible and love bomb their victims in the submission. A fishing expert warns as romance scams soar. So despite a change here and a tweak there, I nearly read that as twerk. I'm oh, drinking too much Pepsi. Um, so despite a change here and a tweak there, romance scams have largely remained the same for the past 15 years. And Ronnie says that, who's a preferable threat advisor at fishing protection, protection firm, Cofence. Scammers are ledger, leveraging dating apps, I should slow down, and online chats to bombard victims with love and attention until they are ready to share their fortunes with somebody they have never met. Preliminary results from the FBI, Internet, 
Crime Complaint Centre indicate that 2022 was another record year for romance scams with estimated, this is ridiculous, by the way, this is ridiculous, um, 19,000 victims in the US losing a total of 739 million. I can't do the head maths right now, but you have a lot too much money to be throwing it away. Um, I'm happy to be on the receiving end of these millions and fill my um, non-existent cryptocurrency wallet with it all. But <laughs> it says it's a notable increase from 2021 when the reported losses hit a record 547 million, still massive numbers. According to the FTC, it was nearly six times the figure in 2017. Um, with crooks defrauding romance seekers of 1.3 billion in five years since then. More money is lost to romance scams than any other fraud category ex- observed by the FTC. The rise of cryptocurrencies is one factor driving this trend. It's like, ah, it's like if someone's romance scamming you, it's like, do they have cryptocurrency wallets? Do we just, I don't know, are we all just getting scammed by people that are educated to cryptocurrency? I That would worry me when they're like, oh, yeah, oh, I'd love to come and see you. But if you could just deposit $1 million in cryptocurrency into my Bitcoin wallet, then I'll be able to afford the train ticket. Anyway, with payments made to scammers in crypto reaching $139 million in 2020, 21 alone. Victims also paid 36 million to scammers in gift cards, the most widespread payment method. According to the FTC, one in four romance scam victims reported having paid scammers with gift cards. The period now, now, the period around Valentine's Day is when scammers are particularly likely to exploit people looking for companionship or romance online. FBI Officers across the country have warned romance fraud fraud is a global problem with 88 million reportedly lost to dating scams in the UK. It's ridiculous. Anyway, it does not mean online dating should be off limits. No, it shouldn't. It's like, how else are we going to meet people in this day and age? It only means you should exercise caution. Please exercise caution. If it seems too good to be true then I'm sorry, but it probably is. Most of us would like to find that perfect date, but in the meantime, I will have to stick with two fours. So you can find the links to all the stories in the show notes. Bye-bye from me. Thank you, Josh. You will have Dr. Doug back on Friday. Remember, if you're feeling unloved on this day, we're here at Security Weekly. Love you. And feel free to get in touch with us on by the normal means. And all aboard the good ship. Love you long time. See you all next time. Goodbye.